Okay, so we finished talking about the Exodus, and I spent a long time thinking about how we wanted to go to the next section. Because technically the next section is the 40 years of the wilderness. But some of the stuff there's overlap on. So, long story short, we're going to be talking about the conquest, but that's going to include, we're going to kind of go back and forth between the 40 years in the wilderness and the years of the conquest. They're just kind of put together. It was the only way that really made sense. Otherwise, I would have had to keep telling keep telling you guys, okay, hold on, remember this for when we come back, and it just it wouldn't have worked. It, 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 yeah. So um, the first thing we always need to look at is we we established some dates for the Exodus. They we saw that they worked with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the, those dates worked great, and we looked at um, the time of the uh, of the Exodus, and and we saw that those dates worked great great too. Um, once again, David rolls new chronology of moving everything around completely unnecessary. We fit it all in without moving anything, and so now that brings us to the next stage. Okay, so what about proof for Israel in the wilderness and for their conquest? Well, let's look to see. The problem is finding proof of Israel in the wilderness that they are they were still nomads at this point. And nomadic peoples historically have not left much in way of traces. So there's that. Um, the only things that the Old Testament brings up about them leaving are things like a pile of rocks. Not a monument, literally a pile of rocks. The problem with a pile of rocks is that it is a pile of rocks, and it's been thousands of years, and there's been wars, and there's been storms, and it's, it's just been a long time for a pile of rocks to mean anything. Um, so, I mean, we probably won't ever find any of that. But anyways, um, the next thing is that there's many possible locations for many of the things that have been discussed. Um, Hoffmeyer showed you on that map all those different places that have been um, brought up of where they crossed the sea and where the Mount Sinai is and all these different things. And even if we did know which mountain was specifically Mount Sinai, we would have the problem of where on the mountain. So there's that. Then there's this, that there's a whole lot of sand, there's a whole lot of storms. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen videos of, of, the, of the Near East, but it's a very... Things just get covered up with sand. I mean, it's just, it's not really the most, I mean, if you go out to White Sands, for instance, you know how, how many times you have to clear off the road for you to go to White Sands. Well, now imagine that there is no tractor, and there's just a whole bunch of dust storms. I mean, it's just a whole different world over there. Um, and then there's nothing to hold the item. See, a lot of times when we find these ancient, you know, uh, pieces in these archaeological digs, You'll find that they always find them around the remains of buildings or, you know, what, they don't just go out into the middle of the desert and dig. Half the stuff, they didn't even know that it was there. They were just excavating a, a building or, you know, a ruin of some kind and, oh, look, what we found while we were excavating. Here's a pot. You know, and so now saying without any kind of a building to collect the trash, the, the, the stuff, to be able to find those remains, that's not how it works. It's just not. You would you would have to have people out there with shovels. I mean, just digging every every inch of the Sinai Peninsula, which is a huge place to dig, <laughs> and they'd be having to go feet and feet and feet and feet down. And it's not even guaranteed that they would find anything, anyways. Even if they did know where to look. Um, and so then we are we have to return once more to K. A. Kitchen's quote: "The absence of proof is not the proof of absence." This is this cannot be overstated. If if there's an ancient document that cl makes a claim, you don't go to it with a negative assessment first off. You accept it as a possibility, right? It, it doesn't have negative points in its favor. It's just okay. This is an ancient claim, and then you start going around. You get other ancient claims and whatnot, and eventually some things are obviously stretched. But to just go to everything and demand that you have a, a, a paper trail to back up every single ancient claim, that's just, that's just ridiculous. That's, that's not even how history works with anything. With Egypt, why should we do that same thing with the Bible? That just doesn't make sense. Um, 
so then we have two big problems with just denying this. This is Israel's journey and, and everything that happens in the journey with, with Mount Sinai and all this stuff is that it is a key historical detail in Israel history. So what that means is Israelite history hinges on the fact that this is real. Israel has clung to this. It's been a unifying factor, and it still is today. It, it's caused a national holiday, the Passover and all these different things. If we just simply dismiss it as never having happened, we're left with a huge problem of how did this get to be in circulation. But then there's also this other aspect of that, which is two-part. First off, how did Moses get all the people to follow him? If there were no miracles, there were no signs, there were no anything, how would this random you know, uh, uh, nomad from out in the desert have anything to do with these people, regardless of whether they were actually in Egypt or not? Let's say Israel was never in Egypt. They were just a, a group of people out there. What would have been the unifying factor to bring them together? So, I mean, they, there had to have been something. But then also, how is it that Moses was not killed? The Bible itself has many situations where Moses was put in very, very tense situations where he was almost killed by Egyptians, by Israelites, by Midianites. I mean, there are, there are just a ton of different uh, situations where he could have been uh, killed but was not. So the, the problem with having proof of Israel's journey is that that's a two-way street. You know, we can't say, yes, we have found remains in, out in the wilderness, but we've also not find anything, found anything to disprove this. So that kind of leaves us at a standstill. But then when you take in those two last points there about the historical detail and about Moses and about Moses not being killed, that kind of seems to imply that we're in the positive now, that it probably happened. But once again, remember that with, with, with history, historical documents, you don't start it with a negative belief. Oh, I don't believe this until it's proven guilty or guilty until proven innocent. You, you don't do that with, with history. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the timing. Now, when Israel went into, into uh, Canaan to conquer the land, this is more or less um, what they conquered. Now... I, I don't want you to see this as a definite conquering, okay? Those lines, for instance, the, they're not definite. It gives you a general idea of the area that they conquered, but don't push it too far. I mean, they didn't go out there with, like, stakes or anything and mark off the land, and it, it wasn't precise, okay? So just remember that. So maybe the lines are maybe a little bit too defined, Um so 1479, that was when I dated the Exodus. So now moving forward, um, the next pharaoh after Tuthmosis II was had sheep said his wife um, and his sister. <laughs> Super gross. <laughs> and uh, we're left with, the, with, with a lot of things that happened in her reign that leave us scratching our heads. But long story short, there was no, no war. I'm sorry, that's not supposed to say now war. No war for 20 years. And that kind of helped Israel, but it would have helped them a heck of a lot more had they not spent 40 years in the wilderness rather than, <laughs> you know, if they would have gone straight into Canaan, it would have really helped them. But eh. anyways, uh, in 1457, uh, Hatshepsut's successor, Tuthmosis III, uh, went up into, uh, into Canaan and had a war. It's called the Battle of Megiddo. It was around 1457. Megiddo's right here. And if you notice... Israel, Egypt. Two different sections there. They're, they're, they're not intermingling here. A lot of people have brought up the point about, well, okay, if Israel was really there, then they would have bumped, bumped heads with Egypt, and that's not even mentioned. That's absolutely true. Not that, e not that Israel was inclined to mention every single thing that happened in the time of the judges, but still. Um, and then there's a, the obvious problem that I'm sure you've noticed, that the Battle of Megiddo happened before. Israel was in Canaan. They were still in the wilderness at that time. So doesn't really affect much of anything. Uh, now there's the issue of world powers at the time that Israel was in Canaan. In the north, there was a, a, a kingdom called the Mitanni. And in the south, there were the, there were the Egyptians. They were going back and forth fighting. Fighting, 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 fighting. Well, eventually, 
what happens is they kind of just wear themselves out and they kind of stay over here uh, going up and down the coast on the highway and they keep having their uh, their squabbles and everything but remember that Israel is still over here they're out of the way so it appears it appears as though Israel and Egypt are having a bunch of near misses just passing right by each other you know barely not getting into into fights because these two are too preoccupied with each other so then eventually what happens is Mitanni the the Mitanni empire or kingdom and the Egyptian empire they actually end up making i believe it was a truce uh because the Hittites started coming to power which was from the area of Turkey and so then Turkey start the Turk uh, Hittite the Hittites actually ended up um winning that little skirmish <laughs> but at the height of the Hittite power, they never came down past Byblos. Now, if you notice, Byblos isn't even on the map. It's up north. So why didn't the Hittite uh, kingdom mess with, and mess with Israel? Well, because they never went that far south. At, so what we find here is that Israel was nestled safely in the midst of a bunch of other bigger warring kingdoms. And it seems like they just kind of ignored Israel and that they just became another Canaanite tribe. And so they were just kind of overlooked, um, which was their saving grace <laughs> because the Hittites, the Mitanni, the Egyptians, they didn't think about coming in and killing them because <laughs> they weren't really a, really their threat. They weren't their first. Um, I thought Egypt occupied the, the south area where Africa is. Right. Right, that's over here. Right. Why, what's up, why did you say they're up there? Okay, so let me just clarify real quick. So this in the southern part of Israel, this right here is Israel, modern-day Israel. Mm -hmm. But at the time of the book of Joshua and Judges, Israel was just kind of spread out in this area here. Okay. okay? Now, this right here is called the Negev. It's, it's the southern border. It's basically desert hills. It's kind of a, a nice little border between Israel and Egypt. Egypt is over here in, in northern Africa, and the Mitanni is who I was talking about. They're up here. Mm -hmm. And then the Hittites came after the they, Mitanni and Egypt had been fighting for a while. The Hittites came down from the Turkey region and came in here. But they never came down so far so as to disrupt Israel. They, their kingdom ended right about here. Mm -hmm. So Israel was, was nestled right here safely where the Mitanni and the Egyptians would go by here fighting. And they were just kind of out of the way. And then the way, when the Hittites came to power, they were still out of the way. And so that's why in Joshua and Judges, we, don't, we have no reference of a war with Egypt, Mitanni, or Hittite. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then uh, 1439, is, 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 it's going to be somewhere around there that, that Israel enters Canaan. So at this point... Um, the Mitanni and the Egyptian squabble, that's still going on. But once again, it really doesn't affect them too much. They're kind of just doing their own thing. Um, Israel was not well-defined. I already kind of mentioned that. This, it's not like they had a kingdom. They were kind of just like uh, another tribe mixed in with the other tribes. So um, a, few, a few things that are worth mentioning... In the book of Joshua, I'll, I'll read a few passages that are that are worth mentioning. And I, there were other ones that I could have mentioned, but I just wanted to keep it kind of simple. Joshua 13, 1 says this. Now, Joshua is old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, <laughs> and there remains yet very much land to possess. There remains yet very much land to possess. There, there's this idea... That Israel went in and conquered everything, the whole land, within like 10 years. And that just, it just, this just didn't happen. Um, so, okay. And he, go, he breaks down the different areas that, that haven't been conquered. He talks about this area here. He talks about this area in here. And some of this area over here. He talks about some of the, um, some of the areas in uh, Lebanon. He gives us, if you want to read it through yourself, there in Joshua 13, he gives us this, this, this list of the things that haven't been conquered. And uh, so when we start putting together the pieces, it's, it's very, very clear and obvious that uh, they were still having, they were still having problems. It was not a, a quick 
um, in and out kind of thing. Now Joshua is the book of Joshua is more focused on the whole. So whereas we can look and say, yes, this battle took a long time, Josh, the book of Joshua emphasizes how quickly it happened because in, in keeping in mind that they've been waiting 430 years, it was a long time. You know, They were gaining ground to the, the, throughout that generation and to the next generation. Unfortunately, it quickly went south after that. Joshua 23.1 says this, A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel, is that... A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, Joshua is old and well advanced in years. That tells us right there this was something that did not happen overnight. This was something that, that, that did take a, a certain amount of time. So the good news in all of this, though, is that Egypt somewhat softened Canaan uh, for Israel to move in. It was like it was like a even even though they got held up in the de desert for forty years, it worked out towards their benefit. Uh, because um, Megiddo formed with some of the other Canaanite uh, uh, towns, kings, whatever, uh, to oppose uh, Egypt. And so while they were down into the desert, they had their little skirmish, and Tuthmosis III, I mean, he wiped them out. He cleared out the area. So they were greatly weakened. And so then uh, Israel comes in, and, you know, they're still not 100%. <laughs> I mean, it just worked out perfect. Um, so there's that. And then also the last thing I wanted to mention before I go to the next slide. When you hear me talk about the Canaanite kings, the kings that live in here, think more chieftains. Don't think king like some guy who owns a bunch of stuff. It, it mm, Typically we're talking about he supervised one city. Okay, this isn't the biggest thing in the world, and the cities weren't weren't that big. Okay, you, you don't think about modern day cities. Even like Tularosa would seem big if you think about it, but no, it, no not they weren't that spread out. Um, uh, I might give you the dimension of Hazor um, next week, or um, not next week, but because we'll be cancer uh, in a couple weeks, just to kind of show you the perspective. But um, anyways, um, so what about a proof of a conquest? Well. So the first place that they hit on their way into Canaan, and, and don't worry about uh, the other stuff about the wilderness. We'll have to come back to talk about some of that stuff. So I haven't forgotten. It just it didn't fit quite yet. Um, the the problem with with Jericho. Okay, well there's there's many problems with Jericho. <sighs> they're pretty sure they've got the right spot. So there there's not a big there, there's not an argument there. There's, I, I imagine there might be some unknown guy who's trying to make a name that says that they've got the wrong site, but no, they, they don't. They've got the right site. It was excavated in the early 1900s, and they said, yep, it, it totally matches to the Israelite conquest of the you know, 1400s. That, that totally works. And then Dame Kenyon comes in, and she says, mm, no, this dates to the 1550, so we've got a problem right there. Um, very big problem. Now, people like David Roll get around this by just saying, hey, let's move all the dates around. <laughs> but that really doesn't help us <laughs> in, uh, because then we have to throw away all those other dates that we said fit so well. So eh, if you want to do that, you can. Um, and her, her method was much more sophisticated than they used in the early 1900s. And she was there, I believe, eight years in excavations, and, I mean, she really did a very thorough. Um, what hers did, this is the way simplified version, but basically think of it as um, strategic squares, and those squares excavated very, very, very well and in-depth. So, yes, you didn't get the full picture, but you got very in-depth to certain key places. A lot of what you date things is based off of pottery and those things. Long story short, there's this ar huge argument that's going on, has been going on for years, um, about Jericho. And really, I don't even see the, an end to, sight, end to sight. After Kenyon's uh, uh, findings were finally published in the, eight, in the 80s, I believe, um, Wood went back to her, Brian Wood went back to her and he said, well, yeah, but you didn't consider a few things. And so he re released another thing saying, mm, 
you were right about that, Kenyon, but you didn't consider this, so it makes more sense to say 1400s. Long story short, Kenyon was basing hers off of a, a, a part of the wall, and uh, there were some... We can talk about some... If you're really curious about it, I can give you guys the, um, the articles for them, or I can summarize it for you. Either way, if you, if you read it yourself, it's going to be a little bit boring. Let me just tell you that, but... Um, anyways, so Wood releases this thing, says, no, it's 1400s, and Binkowski released another thing saying, okay, you're wrong, this Kenyon was right, and Wood released another thing defending his position. So obviously you can see this thing has been going back and forth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's a huge thing there, and then you have a little bit of a problem, because there's two sites for Jericho, and um, it's largely eroded, <laughs> largely eroded, um, and then you have a lot of destruction that happened, and there's just there's just a lot of different factors to take into account there. Long story short, it is a cluster cuss. <laughs> it is a cluster cuss. Why, why don't they go in and, and excavate the whole thing like they've done in other cities? Well, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. Um, there's a lot of politics, and like I said, a lot of it, it has been eroded and just beyond repair. So finding an exact date is a little difficult. Wood is extremely confident of his dating. Yeah. He's extremely confident. It's, it's hard not to get up and caught up in his confidence because, man, he, he's on it. I'm like, yeah, okay, buddy, you're right. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you guys be the judge yourself. Um, so either there is a problem with Jericho and that kind of messes with our dating or there is not a problem with Jericho and it doesn't mess with our dating. A little bit difficult. A little bit difficult. <laughs> so then we get to the second city that Israel attacks, a little place called Ai. Okay, now here's the problem. It was ruins. It was not inhabited at the time that we're saying it, it, it was. All the way from like 2000 to 1200 or something like that, abandoned. It's nothing. So the obvious, the obvious solution to this is, hey, maybe we've got the wrong place. Right? I mean, it's not like there was a rock on it that said, hey, this is where AI was. <laughs> um, another idea is that they had, like, some tents set up outside of the ruins or something. I don't know. Uh, either way, so we're left with, with two strikes. Not looking good, guys. <laughs> um, but then we have a little bit more that kind of needs to be said before we get to going too far on this. And we'll look at the, at the third city that's worth mentioning, Hazor. In just a minute. Um, Israel's initial hold was not overly strong. Don't think that Israel went in there and they just owned the place. Okay, what Joshua talks about is how they weren't at, at war with the Canaanites. Not that they completely owned everything. And so that's something that definitely needs to be considered. And then there's, the, there's, the, there's another thing that kind of needs to be said. And that's that Canaan was not a unified place. Um, Canaan was basically a bunch of warring kings. I mean, it, it, the reason why they could never cast off the shackles of Egypt and other places is because they could never get their act together. Everybody was always fighting amongst themselves. Hey, Isaiah, how you doing? So then that takes us to the third city that we can look at to help us with this dating, the city of Hazor. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Joshua, after they go Jericho and Ai, they go on a southern campaign and take out some cities, and then they go on the northern campaign. The la one of the last places that they hit on the last campaign that they go on was Hazor. Hazor was burned multiple times. Okay, so there's a little bit of problem with with getting too specific about the dating. However, there is not all gloom and despair, guys. It was burned apparently twice. It looks like one of the times was around the 1200s. The the time before that, it appears to have been sometime around 1400. So. If we could just verify Jericho as being in the 1400s, we would have a clear line there, but then that still leaves us with the problem of AI. So, a little bit of a problem there. Oh, a little bit of a problem there. Um, so, what, what happened when, when Israel was doing this? Well, what Canaan did is some of them simply migrated. They just left. They just moved. Um, we actually have uh, uh, DNA finds that show that um, a lot of the Canaanites went up to the Turkey-Lebanon area. So um, Israel did not kill off all the Canaanites. It, it never says that they did. And uh, 
So, okay. Uh, some were ignored or joined in. What I mean by ignored is, for instance, Jerusalem, which we'll look at that probably in two weeks, um, where there were some people that were still living there, and they just kind of left them there. We can't really fight you right now. We're not strong enough, so we'll come back to you. So some of the Canaanites were ignored. Some of them migrated. But then others of them were joined. Now, the book of Judges really emphasizes this because um, this was kind of a big no-no that they really were not supposed to do. They did it anyways. And they went and, you know, started interbreeding, intermarrying, and all this stuff, which the issue is not – it's not a race thing. It's not a race thing. It was an issue of holy versus unholy. That, that was it. Okay? Uh, especially in light of recent events, uh, it's sometimes people start putting modern problems on – ancient situations and it's just you, you can't go to the ancient histor historical documents with your modern hang-ups um, not trying to discredit anything that's going on right now but that's not what's happening here so anyways uh, and then here's the problem there's a lot of political shifting that's happening at this time so I want you to not lose track of the big picture here yes it is true that we are stuck with Jericho's dating we don't know if it's 1550 or the 1400s. We don't know. If it was the 1400s, absolutely, that would really, really help us for our dating. That would fit perfectly. But the fact still remains that Jericho was completely and utterly destroyed and was not built again until about 900, 900 BC when that king in the, book, in the Bible, when it says that that king rebuilt it. So look at the big picture. The Bible is proven. It's just that we are a little bit confused about some of the dates. That's it. It says that Jericho was completely destroyed. Archaeology shows us that it was. It says that it was not inhabited. Archaeology shows us it was not inhabited. It says that it was later rebuilt by a king of Israel. That's exactly what we, what archaeology shows us. So so we're 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 in we're in the good here. It's just the little bit of an issue that we're having with dating, which obviously is going to have big impact on all the rest of it. If, for instance, we could say Jericho was for sure destroyed in 1550, then my dating, as 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 appetizing as I've made it appear, it's out the window. If you can't if you can't get it to match up with other dates, it's no good. So there's there's that problem there. Um, then the problem with Hatsor, we are almost 100% positive burned two times, and that that first time was sometime around 1400. The big picture here is that the Bible says that it was burned by Joshua around the 1400s. Now, it doesn't say completely de destroyed. Evidently, when they burned it, they were the people were able to salvage some of their city and rebuild it, and it was burned again 200 years later. So, okay. But the big picture being, it's proven even though the specifics aren't quite worked out. So it's it's not it's not that bad. Another another big, really big important point. Sometimes people say there's no proof of Israel coming into Canaan. We have a sudden increase of the population. This is something that, that, that seems to prove our point. And there's another issue that there was mass migration at the time, people moving around. Why were they moving around? Well, the Bible gives us an idea because Israel was moving in, <laughs> kicking over their water hoses. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, there are the specifics that elude us, but keep in mind that the big picture still seems to say that the Bible – it happens as the Bible says. So just a few other things. Um, okay. Already mentioned that. So long story short, you shouldn't start with the assumption that the Bible's claim is wrong and then make up another story to fit the case, which is a lot of times what you'll find in hist historical books. Israel didn't really come from Egypt. Um, as far as why there was a migration, do, 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 it's like, okay, well, those people were actually there, and this is what they claim happened. So maybe before you go throwing throwing a historical document out the window, maybe just listen to it for a little bit. Um, obviously, though, it, it should be said that Israel was not the only group that was moving into the land of Canaan. There were others as well. So it was a time when, when there was a lot of moving around. Some people were coming in from the Arab places, uh, as well as Israel coming in, as well as some people from the, from the north were moving in. And in the 1200s, the Philistines moved in. So there was really a lot of different... Um, movings that was happening so i thought that whenever they went to conquer canaan that they were supposed to literally like be no other nation than there except them right they never did that um, that was kind of that's kind of the point of the book of judges is it starts off right at the bat but they didn't <coughs> do that 
And so then they started doing sinning with the Canaanites rather than standing against that. And so then God sent something to punish them, and then they repented, and they raised up a judge, and then they fell back into the Canaanite sins, and it just goes on and on and on. Did this happen while Joshua was still alive? Yes, part so of it did start happening. No, Joshua apparently did, but he wasn't able to get all of all of Israel to as well. Now this is alluded to very briefly, and I'll talk about this probably in two weeks. This is kind of alluded to in the end of the book of Joshua. Joshua makes this big speech to him. He says, "Y'all need to decide who you're gonna who you're gonna serve. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve God, but you guys need to figure out what you're gonna do and do it. And then, oh no, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that. And he's like, well, okay, but this is what you gotta do, and you're not doing this." So he seems to be implying that they're already starting to worship other gods. I could be reading into it, but that's what it seems like he's saying. And then you pick up in Judges, and Judges glosses over the end of Joshua, and then shows about how it leads to their big heresy up to the time of uh, King Saul. Yeah, Saul. Yeah, but that was the problem, Diana. <laughs> they weren't listening very good, <laughs> Okay, so let's track the Israelites here for just a little bit. Said uh, no, it's we've been going for about 30 minutes. We're gonna have to stop there. Um, any questions before we get? Well, obviously there's gonna be questions. I stopped in the middle of the lesson. Uh, How does it end? <laughs> anything that can't wait for two weeks? No. Okay. All right. We'll pick up then uh, in two weeks on that.